It's time for another 90s sci-fi movie review, and what better example is there from that era than 1997's Starship Troopers? Starship Troopers can justifiably be seen as part of Dutch director Paul Verhoeven's action sci-fi trilogy that began in 1987 with Robocop, followed by 1990's Total Recall. All three of these hard R-rated films can be characterized by their extensive world building and graphic violence, but also their social commentary and satirical elements. The satirical aspect is most pronounced in Robocop and Starship Troopers, but in the latter film, with its slick propaganda style and blatantly fascist aesthetics, controversy was inevitable. Would you like to know more? Of course you would. I'll just go and click that for you. Starship Troopers was released in November of 1997 and stars Casper Van Dien, Denise Richards, Dina Meyer, and Neil Patrick Harris. The legendary Michael Ironsides, who had worked with Verhoeven earlier in Total Recall, returns in this film as well. Also, special nod to Jake Busey, Gary Busey's son. So if you saw this movie and you thought, hey, that guy looks like a young Gary Busey, well, yeah, now you know why. Starship Troopers had a large budget for its time, $105 million. <laughs> Although that's roughly half the budget for Titanic, which came out the same year, for comparison, consider that both Jurassic Park and The Matrix had a budget of $63 million. Much of the film was shot in and around LA, as well as other locations in California, and many of the outdoor planet-side scenes were shot in Hell's Half Acre in Wyoming. So with the details out of the way, let's talk about plot. The film is, of course, based on Robert Heinlein's 1959 novel. The film diverges significantly from the novel, which is boring as hell and contains very little combat for a book called Starship Fucking troopers. The book is essentially a thinly veiled political manifesto where Heinlein's characters endlessly pontificate about reactionary political ideas. Just how unsubtle is Starship Troopers the book? Well, at one point, the protagonist's inner monologue takes a shot at the labor theory of value, pointing out how absurd it is and that a mud pie will never be more than a mud pie, no matter how much labor you put into it. If you're not familiar with this argument, I'll save you some time and tell you it's basically a very wordy way to tell someone you don't understand how the labor theory of value works. Insofar as there is a plot, the book posits a universe where mankind has an interplanetary civilization, but is threatened by an alien race known as the Bugs. Earth is essentially ruled by one government, and only those who serve in the military or civil service are granted full rights as citizens, particularly the right to vote. An interesting point to note here is that despite being engaged in a seemingly endless war, military service is still voluntary, there's no conscription. Anyway, the book follows Juan Johnny Rico, a young man who aspires to become a citizen and who also spends a lot of time pontificating on political ideas that happen to coincide with those of the author. Rico joins something called the Mobile Infantry, and much of the book is spent describing his training. What was special about the book, and what is probably its only real lasting value, is the introduction of powered armor like the kind Johnny and the Mobile Infantry wear. And I realize at this point some Heinlein defenders will say something like, Without this novel, we wouldn't have things like space Marines in Warhammer 40k. Well yeah, Games Workshop no doubt got a lot of inspiration from Starship Troopers, but their thought process probably went a little something like this. What if we took these two key concepts like war and space and power armor and used them to make something not bloody boring? <laughs> Paul Verhoeven also hated the book. He said he put it down after reading about two chapters and called it, you guessed it, boring. But he also found it to be extremely right-wing and put a pin in that because that's going to be really important later. The film retains the basic setting and some of the characters from the book, while others are altered entirely. But in general, the plot is more or less the same. Earth is ruled by a military government, citizenship requires military service, and there's an interplanetary war against the bugs. And like in the book, we follow Johnny Rico through his recruitment and training. But unlike in the book, there's a lot more action. Imagine that, a story about war that actually spends significant time depicting that war. If there's one thing the book did better, it was the power armor, which is not depicted in the film. However, given the already high budget and special effects of its time, not having the mobile infantry in power armor was probably likely a practical choice and is totally understandable. Now, we can't really get into the story of the film without talking about how the story is told. Verhoeven and the film's screenwriter, Ed Neumeyer, set out to make a film that went against the book, which, as we confirmed earlier, totally sucked and was boring. As most people know today, Verhoeven's Starship Troopers is satirical, but this wasn't his first rodeo. Verhoeven and Neumeyer had worked together on Verhoeven's first Hollywood film, Robocop. Robocop was very much a critique of certain American trends and social issues in the 1980s, but what's relevant here is a technique Verhoeven used to supplement his world building and satirize hypercapitalism. At several points in the film, Verhoeven placed fourth wall breaking advertisements that gave the viewer a better idea of what it feels like to be in Robocop's near future universe. Big is back, because bigger is better. <laughs> 
6,000 SUX, an American tradition. Verhoeven would return to this technique in Starship Troopers, but here it plays an enhanced role. For one thing, Starship Troopers takes place much further in the future, so world building becomes more important. What is more, Starship Troopers' fourth wall breaking scenes are designed to feel interactive as the viewer clicks to learn more about the topics being featured. This sets these scenes apart from later films that use the sci-fi trope of news footage montages to set up their world. Lastly, these scene transitions play a bigger role in Starship Troopers compared to Robocop because war propaganda is a major theme of the film. What about the fascism? Yes, we'll get to that later. One of the things you notice right away about Starship Troopers is the quiet, minimalist opening title. I don't know why, I just love that. Right after that, you're pulled into one of these propaganda broadcasts, which transitions into an in-media res scene where the Federation military is attacking the Bugs' home planet. One unique thing to note here is that the film actually begins with its protagonist seemingly being killed. Then the film rewinds and we see Johnny and his friends in their last year of high school. We get a brief scene of a class discussion in which Johnny is asked to define the difference between a citizen and a non-citizen, or civilian. And we learn the basic philosophy of the Federation society, which is laid out by his teacher, Mr. Ratchak. We don't get a lot of details here other than how democracy was seen as a failure and military veterans supposedly saved society from chaos and ruin. Johnny wants to go into the Starfleet like his girlfriend, Carmen Ibanez, but his aptitude isn't quite up to par. Still set on attaining full citizenship, even against the wishes of his father, Johnny decides to join the mobile infantry, basically the grunts. Meanwhile, Doogie Hauser, I mean Carl, manages to get into something called games and theory. Johnny is separated from his girl, but is joined at basic training by his other hot friend, Dizzy Flores. Now the mobile infantry training scenes are very important, so we have to spend some time talking about them. First, there's the training camp set. For a 90s sci-fi film, it looks fine, but later we learn that there's a live firing range essentially in the middle of the camp, which is absolutely ridiculous. Although ridiculous might have been what Verhoeven was going for because right away we see how insanely brutal the training is when Johnny's drill sergeant, Zim, played by Clancy Brown, literally breaks a recruit's arm and chokes out Dizzy. Later, Zim impales a recruit's hand with a throwing knife. Unfortunately, Johnny's heart is broken when Carmen informs him that she's been sleeping with his best friend Mark from upstairs. Everybody betrayed me. I fed up with his world. Oh wait, no, sorry, that's the wrong Johnny. This Johnny's heart is broken when Carmen tells him that their long-distance interplanetary relationship isn't going to work. Johnny excels in training and is made squad leader, but he makes a mistake during a live fire exercise and gets one of his squad mates killed. Yeah, that's right, one of his squad mates and not, say, anyone behind the range or in one of these towers. After being punished by flogging for his infraction, Johnny decides he isn't cut out for service and begins to leave. But then disaster strikes when a meteor sent by the bugs wipes out Johnny's hometown of Buenos Aires. The Federation declares total war and Johnny takes back his resignation and joins his friends for a major attack on the bugs' home planet, Clendathu. We get back to where we started at the beginning of the film and we continue on with the war from there. It's hard for me to judge exactly how I felt about the movie the first time I saw it. I should point out that I rented it about a year or two after it came out. What I do remember is I didn't really like it too much back then. I think the sets reminded me of typical 90s sci-fi TV shows, and the acting seemed really corny. I think what I was expecting was something more like James Cameron's Aliens, and Starship Troopers is certainly not that. Cameron had an advantage in that Aliens largely takes place in the dark, with confined locations where it's possible to make sets that look more realistic and lived in, as opposed to having that Star Trek Next Generation look and feel to them. Plus, Aliens is a close quarter battle between a platoon of Marines and several hundred Xenomorph, whereas in Starship Troopers, Verhoeven was trying to stage full-scale battles, a much greater challenge. Finally, I think my initial negative impressions can be explained by youth and ignorance. Ignorance of the technical details of filmmaking, which meant I didn't appreciate the practical effects or judicious use of CGI in the film. You have to remember that in the 90s, CGI was used rather sparingly and usually only looked good in the really big films. Films like Terminator 2 or Jurassic Park. Starship Troopers had Jurassic Park's legendary Phil Tippett working on bugs both in the practical and CGI forms, and great care was taken in this film to make sure that the actors reacted properly to the bugs they couldn't see during shooting. Also, at the age of 16, we often take ourselves too seriously, and so it's hard to enjoy something that is deliberately camp or cheesy. I'm sure at the time I was probably thinking, I can't openly enjoy this over-the-top sci-fi movie. I can only love serious films like Clear and Present Danger or Michael Collins. In short, I didn't get it. But speaking of not getting the point of Starship Troopers, it's time to talk about how critics, at least in the U.S., received the film. Yeah, that means we're going to talk about the fascism. So as you might have guessed, American film critics didn't like the film. How badly received was it? Well, Verhoeven himself claims the Washington Post said he made a neo-Nazi film. So 
pretty bad. Kind of insulting to a guy who spent part of his childhood surviving under Nazi occupation, to say the least. To be fair, Verhoeven and Neumeyer didn't talk much about their intentions around the time of the film's release, and they deliberately pushed the envelope when it came to including Third Reich imagery. Some scenes were lifted almost shot for shot from Lenny Riefenstahl's Nazi propaganda film Triumph of the Will. You've got these uniforms, which are very reminiscent of World War II German army uniforms, and then there's, well, Doogie Himmler over here. Hollywood was used to films that appropriated Nazi imagery, but of course this was done for those films' villains, not the protagonist in the society they fight for. The director and writer's goal was to tell two stories. One, a coming-of-age story about these friends, and the other is about how they're gradually drawn into a fascist mindset. They're seduced by militaristic propaganda, and at the same time, Verhoeven wanted to seduce the audience as well. After all, the audience is supposed to identify and root for the protagonist. It wasn't until nearly a decade after the film's release that critics began re evaluating it. One even claiming that Verhoeven had made a film too smart for its own good. Now if you look up any review of the film from the past 10 years or so, you'll learn all about Verhoeven and Neumeier's intent and how the film was a satire of fascism. I for one find it interesting to think about what changed besides Verhoeven talking about it. Well think back to 1997 when the film came out. Love that year. Critics saw this film that was apparently portraying a militaristic society in a positive light and its heroes are dressed like literal Nazis. Johnny and his friends are coded as typical American teenagers, but they're a part of this system, and the film apparently wants us to root for them. I'm sure many American critics found that idea pretty offensive in 1997. They were probably like, who does Paul Verhoeven think he is? What does he think of America? That we're a bunch of military-worshipping yahoos? As if, like, in the film, there could be some kind of horrible tragedy, and then we all just stop caring about things, like freedom of speech, and we start idolizing the military in all kinds of inappropriate occasions? Or <laughs> maybe we get involved in some endless war abroad with no concrete strategic goals and we dehumanize our enemies to the point that we don't even care how many civilians get killed or what authoritarian regimes we support because nothing is more important than finding and wiping out the enemy. Yeah right buddy. I'm sure that would really happen. Apparently they've got some good shit in Amsterdam. Maybe you should like go direct some windmills or tulips or a uh, John Frost bridge in Arnhem. Yeah. So yeah, in case that little bit's not painfully clear enough, I think a big part of people not getting the point of Starship Troopers had to do with timing. I think someone who remembers 9-11 and the years immediately following it would pick up on a lot of things watching the film for the first time, things that someone in 1997 would have totally missed. A good comparison here is Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. It came out post 9-11 and well into the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thus, everyone spotted the political themes, themes like a leader using war as a pretext for increasing their authority, what was obvious, or perhaps even on the nose in 2005, might have seemed absurd to a viewer in 1997. But now that everyone knows Starship Troopers is a satire of fascism, questions remain. Did Verhoeven do a good job of portraying it? Was this his best way to deliver the message he was aiming at? I think the biggest question is, what happens when the audience doesn't get the message? To illustrate what I mean, let me tell a personal anecdote. Once I saw a really good deal on a Starship Troopers themed t-shirt, so I thought, why not? because I love nerd shit like this. I was wearing it at the gym one day when I run into a guy who has another Troopers inspired shirt. So we exchange banter and right before we leave he says, that's the movie that made me want to join the military. And I was just kind of dumbfounded like, I think you missed the whole point, dude. So why do people miss the point? Is it always the viewer's own fault? And what can creators do to make sure they don't accidentally make something like totalitarianism seem appealing? Well, I have to start with the caveat that you can never fully control how people will receive a message. There will always be some people who read about a horrible dictatorship and all the atrocities it has committed and decide it's actually good because they like the uniforms or something. But I think in Verhoeven's case, he was trying to create a satire of a fascist propaganda film and a Hollywood sci-fi blockbuster at the same time. So he had to carefully balance things to a point where at times the satirical aspect fails. To understand what I mean here, we must analyze what we know about the society portrayed in Starship Troopers, the Federation. As always, we're limited by what we can hear and see on screen. First of all, aesthetics aside, it's clear the Federation isn't Nazi Germany. Everything we see shows us a society that is more inclusive than American society today in terms of gender and ethnic groups. The only major social hierarchy we see is the divide between citizens and civilians, and judging solely by the living standards of Rico's civilian parents and the life his father wants for him, we can't say that civilians are particularly oppressed in this society. The most disturbing aspect of this is a line that implies the existence of permits to have children, but even then the character says it's 
easier for citizens, implying that civilians can still get them. Probably the most disturbing thing we see is a man apparently convicted of murder and sentenced to a quick execution that is to be televised. Another aspect of the civilian-citizen divide to consider is that there appears to be no bar to becoming a citizen other than the person's own will. If they said you have to serve to get citizenship, but then restricted service to males or members of a certain ethnic group, that would be an obvious sign of oppression. But in this society, it seems anyone can join up and in Rico's case, leave as they please. And the double amputee recruiter suggests that the Federation is happy to find any job to accommodate any potential recruit. This totally voluntary aspect of the Federation military puts it at odds not only with Nazi Germany, but also nearly every fascist and communist regime that ever existed. The Nazis hated that Weimar Germany was restricted to an all-volunteer army, and national conscription was a specific part of their original party platform. The Federation that we see, on the other hand, basically says if you want to be a full citizen, you've got to demonstrate your commitment to society in some way. And if you're willing to do that, they'll accept you no matter who you are. We also see no obsession with tradition or conservative values in the Federation or its propaganda. The closest it has to some kind of value or ideology seems to be an extreme sense of civic responsibility and the idea that the military is the best expression of this. Problematic for sure, but not fascist. Young people are apparently sexually liberated, people don't seem to be racist towards one another, and Mr. Ratchak, the film's main vector of the state's ideology, seems to put a lot of stock in the idea of individual choice and independence. Figuring things out for yourself is the only freedom anyone really has. Use that freedom. Make up your own mind, Rico. Then there's the question of how the military works in this film. The training scenes make Full Metal Jacket look tame by comparison, as cadre are apparently allowed to severely injure recruits, and flogging is still used as punishment. But we only see this in the elite infantry training, and we know that in this system, you volunteer and you can leave at any time. Also, the disastrous Battle of Clendathu might seem reminiscent of how the Imperium of Man in Warhammer 40k throws away millions of Imperial Guard troops just to hold on to a world, implying that the Federation views its soldiers as cheap resources to be spent. But if you're paying attention, that really isn't the case. The debacle of Clendathu clearly looks like a huge miscalculation, comparable to many real historical battles. In fact, one character even calls it that. Someone made a big goddamn mistake. The defeat on Clendathu is covered pretty openly in the media, whereas historical totalitarian states like Nazi Germany and Japan often carefully concealed the reality of their losses. What is more, upon defeat, the commander of the operation admits responsibility, steps down, and then the Federation adopts a new, smarter strategy. It's fairly clear that they made an arrogant but understandable mistake because they thought they were facing a species of unintelligent bugs and they had superior firepower. When they were proven wrong, they changed strategy instead of just throwing more and more human waste at the enemy that clearly outnumbers them. Commissar would not approve. Lastly, there's the issue of how the humans view the enemy, the bugs. The only good bug is a dead bug. It's clear in the film that there's public dissent about war against the bugs, even questioning whether it was the humans' fault for pushing into their region of space instead of just leaving them alone. The pro-war people are all enthusiastically cheering for the total extermination of the bugs and want nothing more than to kill them. I get how this is a stand-in for how nations at war dehumanize their enemies, but this doesn't work too well because the bugs are, well, bugs. You can't dehumanize something that was never human to begin with, and they're clearly hostile to humans. The human hatred towards the bugs in the film, particularly after the attack on Buenos Aires, is pretty justified to be honest, and like I said, they were never human to begin with. So what was Verhoeven and Neumeier's mistake that might have led people to identify with the regime they wanted people to see as fascist? Well, when you tally up all these points I've just made, you see the problem is they made the society that was supposed to be a stand-in for fascism a sort of utopia. Apart from the disturbing attitude towards capital punishment, the most fascistic thing about the society is largely a matter of aesthetics. When you say you're trying to portray this society as fascist and then include strong signs that it is more inclusive and egalitarian than the actual society of its time in some respects, you're going to confuse people. And yes, Verhoeven said the whole film is supposed to be propaganda, but that's the problem. Which parts, outside of the obvious news segments, are really propaganda and which aren't? Earlier I talked about how the Federation restricts citizenship to those who served, but doesn't bar entry to anyone who wants to do so. So. In reality, a society that so restricts franchise most likely wouldn't be that open to just anyone. It's more likely that the requirement of military service would be used specifically to disenfranchise minorities or women, much in the same way that segregation in the U.S. was used to deny African Americans many of the benefits that white soldiers received after the Second World War. Real-world authoritarian regimes have often restricted minority or marginalized groups from the officer corps or civil service. The fact that Johnny Rico's family is so well off despite not being citizens 
citizens is also questionable and could give the naive viewer the idea that the veterans rule over wider society as benevolent dictators. This bit might seem more realistic if we were ever shown evidence of a big, oppressed underclass of civilians, maybe with an explanation as to why Johnny's family is so well off. Also, in a society where someone could be convicted of murder and sentenced to death later that evening, it's really odd how nobody seems to be worried about secret police or voicing opinions that differ from the mainstream. The Federation also seems to put a strong emphasis on personal responsibility even for its military leaders. Another thing you usually don't see in real-life dictatorships in which the powerful continually fail upward. Hell, that's true even in non-authoritarian states. Basically what happened here is, wittingly or not, Verhoeven and Neumeier created a society that was more ambiguous than they might have anticipated, but it's also practically a utopia in some respects, and thus it's reminiscent of old myths about fascism, such as Mussolini making the trains run on time, or Hitler's economic miracle. Bullshit! To be fair, however, Verhoeven wanted the society to look attractive. He was deliberately taking that risk because it was supposed to show how propaganda works, and propaganda isn't effective if it doesn't convince. If you're a writer or some other creator whose story or universe involves a fascist faction or dystopia, and you're concerned that people might interpret it favorably, I can offer a few tips that might help all but the densest audience members understand that your stand-ins for fascists or totalitarians are, in fact, bad. This is because I spent a good portion of my life living in a right-wing authoritarian state and have known many people who have experienced even worse regimes. Without getting into too much detail, I'd say the most important thing you want to include about your dystopian authorities is that they are corrupt, hypocritical, and lie constantly in the face of overwhelming and readily available evidence to the contrary. Their vaunted achievements are typically shams and showpieces meant to impress outside observers. Nepotism is commonplace and incompetent people are given cushy jobs and important positions simply based on their personal connections to the leader. Although you want to portray fascists as they typically are, hypocritical, absurd, and incompetent, any serious depiction of fascism ought to show how it attracts people in the first place. Fascism plays on very common emotions. It promises the adherent simple explanations for complex problems. It provides meaning and narrative to a universe that often seems chaotic and random. It makes its adherents feel powerful and unbound by the rules governing others, simply by nature of being part of the in-group. In short, fascism seduces, and in time, it eventually destroys even its own believers. I think one of the best quotes on this reality comes from the 1955 book, They Thought They Were Free, The Germans from 1933-1945, by Milton Mayer. Mayer's book was based on interviews he conducted in post-war Germany, and one passage in particular has always stuck with me all these years. Now I see a little better how Nazism overcame Germany, not by attack from without or by subversion from within, but with a whoop and a holler. It was what most Germans wanted, or under pressure of combined reality and illusion, came to want. They wanted it, they got it, and they liked it. I came home a bit afraid for my country, afraid of what it might want and get and like under combined pressure of reality and illusion. I felt and feel that it was not German man that I met, but man. He happened to be in Germany under certain conditions. He might be here under certain conditions. He might, under certain conditions, be I. Really makes you think, doesn't it? Honestly, I I could talk about the politics of Starship Troopers forever because it is a fascinating concept. The film can be seen as a kind of social experiment akin to the third wave, a California history teacher's 1967 experiment to teach his high school class about how the Nazis came to power. But if we look at it just as a film, it is exceptionally good. Timeline-wise, there's a lot of build-up to Johnny actually getting into combat, so we begin later in media res just to start the film off with a little action. Johnny is a perfect hero's journey protagonist, complete with a mentor character, and he has a very good art. The story never really drags, there's always something going on. Yes, the sets do look a little 90s sci-fi TV-like, but on the plus side, they're physical structures rather than CGI, and everything looks more real than a lot of these 21st century films. The puppetry and conscientious use of CGI can really be appreciated in our modern era of computer-generated blockbusters that look like video game cutscenes. This was a very ambitious film, and a lot of time was spent portraying different types of combat in this futuristic war. The soundtrack was done by Basil Poldoris, who had previously worked with Verhoeven on Robocop and scored other films such as The Hunt for Red October. The theme for the Klondathu Assault is one of the most memorable compositions in an action film and complements the scene perfectly. There are also a lot of funny behind-the-scenes facts about the film. The best is probably about the shower scene when Verhoeven insisted that the actors do it in the nude. The story goes that he told the cast nudity was no big deal, and Dina Meyer asked, if it's no big deal, why don't you direct it in the nude? Then Verhoeven and his director of photography stripped down and everyone did the scene with no problem. Verhoeven 
Hovind later commented on how he found it funny that Americans seem to have far more problems with nudity in his films than the wanton violence. The acting is pretty cheesy, but when I think back on my own military experience, people were saying dumb shit all the time, so I can let that slide. If anything, it gave us a lot of quotable lines and things to riff on with friends. You know, once we can gather with friends again. Basically what I'm saying is, it's a competent and fun action film to watch, and I think it's interesting how you can have what was intentionally made to look like a big dumb blockbuster, and yet it has this whole other layer that provokes debate and discussion about so many pressing social and political issues. Not many films do that. I know today it's cliche to hate on comic book films, especially Marvel films, but I've got to say it gets a little tiring when some people act like there's profound social commentary in these mass-produced blockbusters with CGI-filled battles so long and flashy that your brain gets desensitized and you can't remember how the movie ended. Looking at you, Avengers Age of Ultron. By contrast, Starship Troopers is an entertaining movie, but at the same time, raises all kinds of questions. Is it really about fascism if the Federation doesn't seem to be truly fascist? Or does it not seem that way because the film is an unreliable narrator and everything we see in it is propaganda? What is the film's propaganda not showing us? How does the behavior and propaganda depicted in the film compare to trends in our own societies, wherever we may live? There's so much to talk about. The film spawned two direct-to-video sequels, but I must admit I haven't seen all of them. I've seen some people suggest the third one is decent, but I've seen a little bit of it and I must respectfully disagree. I will, however, say it was interesting to see that Casper Van Dien is still there as Johnny Rico, and the film still opens with that minimalist white text on a black background. There is also an animated series and an unsuccessful PC game at some point. Nothing really worth tracking down unless you're a huge fan. After Starship Troopers, Verhoeven directed the film Hollow Man, which didn't do too well, and pretty much marked the end of his Hollywood sci-fi days. His career in the United States is interesting to look back on because the first thing he did when he showed up was create one of the greatest modern pop culture icons of the 80s, worked with one of the biggest action stars of that era, and then capped it off by making a film that caused a lot of folks to think he was advocating fascism until well over a decade later when people were like, oh wait, he was saying that's bad. You could say he was a kind of auteur in the sense that these three films at least had very distinct hallmarks, such as the use of fourth wall breaking ads, brand names in the future, and of course those legendary Verhoeven blood squibs, each of which seems to contain contain a full liter of cow's blood or whatever they use. Starship Troopers itself was highly influential in later pop culture, and we see things that may have been inspired by it in franchises like StarCraft and Half-Life 2, for example. Also, the body armor used by the infantry ended up getting reused in the sci-fi series Firefly once. In conclusion, Starship Troopers is a ridiculously entertaining film that provokes interesting intellectual debate. I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it, and I highly recommend not reading the book because you only have so much precious time left on this planet. If you want to read about space war and power armor, Warhammer 40k. Okay, it's that simple. Anyway, folks, that's the end of the review. So you know what time it is. It's time for me to ask you to click like and subscribe and to share the video and maybe leave a comment. Any questions about the film or maybe your opinions on it. Always like to hear that. It's good for the algorithm, good for the channel. And of course, check the description where you see a link to my Patreon page and you can support my work, keep things running. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching.